was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name Yeah.
so thankful that we know the enemy will run, he will flee in your presence. God, and that we can call on you. And God, we've read the word and we know that there will be a victory. God, we just claim that victory today in this crazy world. You are our light, you are our hope, and we thank you so much today. God, we love you. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Check, check, check. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you uh, for being here this morning. Thank you for joining us online. And it is, uh, it's a really great thing to be a part of the church. It's a great thing to be a part of the people of God and come uh, together and just remember some truths that the people of God need to be, need to be um, remembering on a regular basis in a pretty crazy, crazy world. Um, before we kind of get into some stuff that I'm super excited to share, uh, I've had a few people ask how I did in the golf tournament because I told hundreds of people that we were going to win, and uh, we didn't come close to winning. Um, so, yeah, that's don't ask me about it anymore. I don't want to hear it. Okay. Um, so, but there is. I did love the tournament. It was a lot of fun. I love seeing a lot of guys, and yeah, the team did a really good job of putting that together. And so, thank you for everyone who was involved, and thank you for everyone who came out. Uh, it was a great time. And here's kind of a little golf joke or golf riddle uh, on behalf of my friend Kelsey Settle. Here we go. A young man with a few hours to spare one afternoon, uh, figures that if he hurries and plays very fast, he can get in nine holes before he has to head home. As he's about to tee off, an old gentleman shuffles onto the tee and asks if he can join him. Although worried this will slow him up, the younger man says, of course. To his surprise, the old man plays quickly. He doesn't hit the ball very far, but it goes straight. Furthermore, the old man moves along without wasting any time. When they reach the ninth fairway, the young man is facing a tough shot. A large pine tree sits in front of his ball directly between it and the green. 
After several minutes pondering how to hit the shot, the old man says, you know, when I was your age, I'd hit the ball right over that tree. With the challenge before him, the young man swings hard, hits the ball, watches it fly into the branches, rattle around, and it landed about a foot from where it started. Of course, says the old man, when I was your age, that tree was only three feet tall. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, it's a good one. Now on to some stuff that's a little more important, um, but man, golf's a good thing to talk about. Anyways, um, we are super excited to get things back up and running. Um, I really, really do believe that the gathering is super important, and we're excited to get that started. Uh, we're, we've prayed about this. We've thought about this for months, as you know, and uh, we believe that it's important for the spiritual health of hundreds of people uh, to get the buildings back up and running, and we also believe that people who aren't even in the faith yet come to know Jesus here, and uh, that's our mission, and we believe that it's going to help us fulfill the mission that Jesus has given us to make followers of Jesus, who in turn make followers of Jesus, and so we're fired up uh, to get started, and uh, we're believing God to do some extraordinary things. And so here are a few dates. I'm going to start with our student ministry. I'm excited about our student ministry getting back up and running. We're going to kind of revamp some things. We're going to kind of try a different model, and we think it's going to be a great way to reach a whole lot of kids in this area. And so mark your calendars next Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it's not the edge, but we're going to kind of have a vision night and a movie on the parking lot. The weather is going to be absolutely perfect. So if you have a middle schooler or high schooler, get them, get them up here. We're going to just kind of talk about what the edge is going to look like this semester and in the days to come. And uh, we're going to watch a movie out on the parking lot. It's going to be a great time to get the students together. So if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, uh, you know, this is an important event to get them here just to where they're kind of in the loop. Uh, and then we're going to take a week off on the 18th. And then we're going to, the, the edge is back up and running. It's going to be fully operational here on October 25th. And so we're excited, 6 p.m., October 25th. We were originally going to do it on the 18th, but I thought, you know what, let's make the 25th at the Super Bowl Sunday here because that is also when we reopen uh, our Sunday morning services at 9 and 11 a.m. with Kids Ministry, and so we're fired up about that as well. And so if you're watching online, if you're here, come on up, um, and it's going to be, uh, I think, a beautiful opportunity again to connect with God and to see a whole lot of people maybe that you haven't seen in a long time. And so we're fired up about that. October 25th here at Arnold, and then I'm actually at Oak Bridge City a good bit, and I'm excited to announce that two weeks after the opening date here on October 25th, on November 8th, we are going to be opening at Oak Bridge City as well. And so we're fired up to get that up and running, and uh, again, we're believing that God's going to do some extraordinary things, and we we believe that the gathering of believers is important as it has been for 2,000 years and really beyond into the Old Testament when the people of God would gather together at the temple to hear the word of God, to, 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 to think about it and to grow in their faith. And so we are super, super, super excited about that. And I do want to announce, if you're watching online, there is... No judgment if you're like, I'm just, I'm just not ready. I don't feel comfortable. In fact, we would encourage you, if that's you, you can stay home and we will continue to have an online, uh, an online gathering for you to join. And so, uh, so yeah, we're, we're fired up about, about that. Next, if you're interested in baptism, I know we have some baptisms lined up. I'm having a conversation with a friend at Oak Bridge City who has actually been wrestling with who Jesus is um, really for the last year or so, and she's kind of making the decision to get baptized, and so I'm super excited for that conversation. We have multiple people here signed up for baptism who are going to take their next step in their faith and publicly confess their faith in their Lord Jesus Christ, and we're fired up about that. And if that's you, if you're a believer in Jesus and you have not stepped into the water, Waters of baptism, uh, we would we would really believe that that's your next step. And so, if, again, you're a Christian, haven't been baptized, uh, and you're watching online. There's actually a tab. If you're interested, you can you can uh, you can fill out your name in that tab. I guess I've never clicked on it, but I'm guessing that's what you'll do. And then we'll, and then we'll and then we'll re we'll get in touch with you. We'll reach out to you, and uh, we're excited to keep that conversation uh, that conversation going. And so, uh, I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm excited to hear a word from. God uh, through Pastor Tom. I'm excited to receive the Word of God, and uh, I'm already grateful for, for what's taking place this morning, and I've loved conversations, and I'm just excited for what God has in store for us. And before we go into what's next, we're actually going to have a time of prayer. And so uh, we're just going to kind of give everyone in here at home, if you're, if you're, if you're at your home, just kind of find a space that's maybe, you know, comfortable, uh, quiet maybe, and let's just spend a, a few minutes together uh, in prayer. And so I'm going to kind of give you some things to kind of guide you. And so we're going to start by just praying for our country. 
Uh, we're going to start by praying for our country. You can pray for the president as he uh, has COVID-19. Uh, you can pray for uh, both political parties and the division going on uh, and the unrest. And really just pray that God does, some, God does something extraordinary in this time. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we uh, pray for uh, our country, the United States of America, um, and in the coming days, we pray for, um, for you to work and for you to move, um, and we pray for unity, uh, for peace here in the United States. Uh, we pray for honor, for authority here uh, in the United States, and God, we pray for love to prevail, but honestly, as I pray that out loud, I, 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 um, I don't think that's going to happen in the world uh, I just don't, but I know it should happen in your church, and, uh, and it has to. And so, Lord, we pray that that definitely takes place in the church of the United States of America, where love um, overcomes the hatred that's going on uh, in the world out there. Um, I pray that there's unity in the body of believers who have a diversity of thought in regards to issues going on, and I pray that Jesus can be glorified above all of this. Lord, I pray that um, our allegiance isn't to the left or to the right, but our allegiance is up, our allegiance is to you, the King of heaven and earth, and we are grateful to know you and love you. And God, as I look and I see a lot of people who seem to put their hope in, in personalities, to seem to put, the, to put their hope in policies, I am grateful that my hope is a whole lot more sure than that. We're grateful for Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who is, who is a strong, steadfast anchor of our hope, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen, amen, amen. If you guys want to take a moment and as we just kind of think about hope, this is a time where a lot of people might be a little bit hopeless, where things are difficult, where things are challenging. If you would just look at statistics, you would see that depression really, especially since March, but for a long time, is just way up. Suicides are way up. Um, hopelessness is way up. Um, anxiety is way up. And people are, are just really struggling and suffering to a lot of things that have gone on, um, especially over the past few months. And so if you just would pray for m maybe even just a family of believers who are struggling um, in regards to their hope and where to find it, and just pray that God would provide that for them in these days. Spend some time in prayer. Father, you give hope to the hopeless, you give strength to the weary, uh, you bring peace to those who are in despair, and Lord, we, we, we ask that you, you, you do so now. Um, Father, I'm sure that names came to mind, maybe it's someone in this room, they thought it was themselves, and Lord, I pray that you um, give them the wisdom and the grace and just the, the strength to pursue you and to pursue truth, to, to think about things that are good and lovely and pleasing in these days to where they can um, experience the hope uh, that you have provided for them, a hope that is not just temporal, but it's an eternal, eternal hope that we're grateful for. And again, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And lastly, if you could just pray for, for families, uh, if you could pray for families in this time and, and really kind of couple that with just kind of our mission. And we believe that it takes place. We, if, 
if you've been at Oak Bridge for any time at all, you know that we put a lot, a lot, a lot of energy and effort into pouring into families and students and kids and, and just pray that families in this time period that that is difficult, that it is challenging, that they would grow in Christ, that students would come to know Jesus, that parents would come to know Jesus, and the church would continue uh, to move forward in these days in the lives of families in this area that God has called us to reach. And so let's go to God in prayer. Father, so many different family dynamics. Uh, you have single parents, single moms, uh, single dads um, who are trying to work and then provide homeschool and pay bills and a bunch of different things. You have, um, you have two-parent homes that are in shambles due to all these different things that are going on. Um, you have students. You have kids who feel lonely and isolated due to not being at school and seeing their parents. You have kids falling behind in academics. You have families who, are, who have had people impacted by the virus in regards to their health. There are a bunch of different issues going on. And again, we just pray that you provide them something that only you can. And Lord, really above all else, we pray that you're glorified in this time period. Uh, we know that really a lot of times in, in times of pressure, um, you know, that's when, that's when I think purpose is, is best found. And so, Lord, I pray that we as your church, as parents, as kids, as students, as high school students, as middle school students, that we could just kind of, again, see that our main purpose in life is to point people to Jesus Christ, who is the only hope. And so we pray that that takes place in this time, and we pray that as a church we could do a... Uh, we could, we could be effective at, at leading that uh, to where people can come to know Jesus Christ and uh, your mission can be moved forward. And Lord, we pray that as Pastor Tom comes up, that you speak through him and that, again, this would just be one step more, uh, one step forward, one step closer to you uh, in our process of becoming more like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's hear a word uh, today. Well, thank you, Josh, for those words and those prayers for all of you. I am Tom Noblet. Welcome to Oakbridge Community Church. I want everybody that's watching online right now and that's in this room or outside, wherever you're at, uh, I want you to say after me, I'm not crazy to follow Jesus. Yeah, it was probably uh, a good 20, 25 years ago I heard a pastor say, I just want you all to know you're not crazy for following Jesus. And I remember thinking at that time, that was spot on. I needed to hear that. Because at times, you know, you're, you're so different from the world. You think, am, am I just nuts? Am I the only one that, that sees the value of Christ? Do I, am, and, and I'm just here to tell you, you're not crazy for following Jesus. And if you're a person that's not there yet, I want to tell you that those people that are act a little different, they're not crazy. They're just different for following Jesus. And uh, I'm inviting everybody into that craziness of sanity of following Jesus. Can I say it that way? In other words, it's, it's, it's a wise thing to follow Jesus. And I'm just encouraging all of you that have done it to amp up more. That's really where this series comes out of, the series called Full of It. Most people, like I said last week, they, they like the idea of heaven. I haven't had many people that go, no, you know, I want to go where there's bad stuff. And, you know, that's not it. Most people like the idea of heaven. You don't have to sell them on that. Uh, but many people, they refuse the message of Jesus Christ because they're apprehensive about what they think Jesus is calling them into now. I mean, between now and heaven, we see it clearly, this thought process with teenagers. They think, I want to grab life and, and, and grab its gusto and have all the fun I can, and then right before I die, I'll accept Jesus Christ. That's what they think, which the, the statement would then be that following Jesus leads you less of a full life than not following Jesus. And I'm just, again, to tell you, you're not crazy for following Jesus. And some of these things that I'm going to be talking about in this series may be reminders for you. Some of them may be that it's the first time you've heard it. But I think uh, I'm going to show you that there's a case for it's just the opposite. Following Jesus is the fullness of life. Here's what they say. If I follow Jesus, then what? And here's just wrote some things I think. I'll have to give up my Friday nights. Can't have fun anymore on Friday nights. No more watching that show, those shows, going to those movies. I can't hang out with them anymore, that group, my friends, whoever it is. I can't hang out with them anymore. I mean, my life's going to get more restrictive. I was at the golf tournament yesterday. 
And my role was to go around and take photos of all the groups and tell them thanks for sh showing up. And I loved it. It was a great time. I'm with my wife, Kathy, in a golf cart for about three hours. It was fun. It really was. Loved it. And, um, but one group I really didn't know, and they didn't know me, and I came down and said, look, I want to thank you guys for all playing in the golf tournament. And I said, I'm the pastor of the church, and I just appreciate what you guys are doing. And they go, oh, you're the pastor. And they all hit each other on the sides, and they go, we can't cuss after we hit a bad shot now. Right? So in other words, the thought is, is here's Tom. He's the pastor. He's a representative of Christ. What a killjoy. I mean, that's kind of what, you know, that's kind of what more people think. And I, and I know they weren't thinking it that way. They're saying being on better behavior. But that's kind of the thought. If you're going to, quote, unquote, do Jesus stuff, you can't be real, you can't be normal, you can't, you can't make mistakes, you can't sin, you can't, and, and I'm, I mean, that's what they think, that's just a restrictive straitjacket. Then they think they've got to give away all their money. You know, that's it, that's all you want. I mean, how many times you guys ever heard that the church, all they want is your money? I mean, that's just, you know, I, I tell people when they tell me that, I say, you worry more, more about your money than I worry about your money. You're talking about money and all the time, what you need to buy, what you can't buy, house payments, more than I'm not talking about it near as much as you are. Then they say to themselves, not money, now they just want my time. So I think they believe that if you follow Jesus, <clears throat> you're going to lose a lot more than you gain, that you're going to give up so much. Heaven, good, following Jesus, not so much. That's kind of the summary of the statement. <clears throat> but if Jesus walked through these doors, if Jesus walked into your house, if Jesus walked wherever you're watching this from, in a car or whatever, if he came into your presence, here's what he would say to that. He says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to take away. He's the great taker. He comes to take away everything you have. Moments of joy, peace, patience, kindness, all. He wants to take it all away. He says, he says but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. The full maximum expression of Life in this world, in this broken, rotten world, the full expression you can have in a world that is very dangerous and very unkind at times, you can experience the fullness, the most fullness I can give you on this earth. So imagine your time of greatest love, greatest hope, greatest joy, greatest peace. He says, I bring that. That's it. And if you say, well, I, I got to give up everything. You're not, you're just really not giving up. You're not. And sometimes I have to remind you of Christians of that because it can feel that way. It can feel that way. But more times than not, you, you, you see something else. There's a fullness, and I, I'm going to hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it. There's a fullness of knowing Jesus that those outside of Christ will never know. There's a fullness in life. It's almost like you live in two worlds at times. This is the world I live in. This is the world people outside of the family of Christ live in. And it's hard for them to relate to your world. And you so badly want them to have this, not to take something away from them, but to give them something you've been given. That's the frustration I have when I try and quote unquote tell, talk about Jesus to my friends. I said, I just, he's not trying to take that from you. He's trying to give you so much more, so, so much more. There's even words for it that I can't even express. God has, I, it's an expressible thing sometimes he wants to give you. There's a fullness to following Jesus. I've lived in St. Louis pretty much my whole life. Last year, I went for the first time ever to the Missouri Botanical Garden. That place is fabulous. I had no clue. I thought I was going to come in and see a couple flowers, turn around and watch out, walk out. I didn't realize there was gardens and areas, and you could walk, and you could be there for three or four hours. I didn't realize any of that. I saw flowers. I was, I was turned into a total nerd. I loved it. Totally loved it. I'm thinking, why 61? It's taken me 60 years to come to Missouri Botanical Garden. It was fabulous. And I tell you what, Kathy doesn't know it, but this week, you know where we're going? The Missouri Botanical Garden. Kathy, now you know, all right? Going back there again, I want to see the trees out there. I want to see what I can see. Right. A week or so ago, for the first time, I went to the St. Louis Art Museum. I loved it. Never been to the St. Louis Art Museum, never. When I go in, and the first rooms I go into are pictures and paintings, five, six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand years old, of Paul and Peter and the depictions of Jesus. And the frames were artwork, and there was sculpture. And I was, I was enthralled. And I ended up seeing a mummy, you know, from Egypt, not a mommy, a mummy. 
and it was 2,000, 3,000 years old. I'm walking around this place, and I'm saying, this is amazing. St. Louis rocks. Can you believe? So the fullness of St. Louis, I never experienced. Next week, you know where I'm going to go? The zoo and then the arch. I've never, no, I've been at the zoo at the arch. I just want you to know that. But not, not exaggerating about many of the places. I've never been to Crown's Candy Kitchen. I mean, I could go on and on. I lived in South County in Oakville. But the fullness of St. Louis I've missed, and I know a lot of you are nodding that I'm seeing here. I'm assuming you're nodding at home going, will you not go ahead? The Botanical Garden's great. The Art Museum's great. There's other places you can even go. Herc was telling me this week, he's after church last week, he told me that he's leaving to drive down, I think it was St. Genevieve, to go hike at a park with his wife. Now, that's one of the good things about this pandemic. I've seen more people do things. And uh, he said, I've experienced all these local parks, Tom, and I've only gone to a couple that are in Oakville. Right? That's the only ones I've gone to. And he says, they're really great. He goes down and hikes a park. It's phenomenal. So the, in Missouri, he said, I'm going to start seeing more state parks. Then I ran into a person that told me, I think there were 62 national parks. She's seeing now nine of them, and her parents have seen 38. And their goal is now to see every national park that the United States has. And the problem is there's two of them that are in Alaska that you can only get to by plane. She doesn't know if she's going to make all 62. But I thought the fullness of the United States, all that fullness that we're talking about, from St. Louis to the state of Missouri to the United States, that's the fullness of Jesus that you want your friend to get. And they live in Oakville, and that's the only thing they see about God, that little thing. That's, that's what I'm trying to get through this whole series, if you can get it. You can miss the fullness of Jesus. You can know who he is. You can know where St. Louis is at. You, you can live in St. Louis. You can know where Missouri is at. And that's, but you can miss the fullness of it. So last week I talked about the freedom of Jesus. That if he sets you free, that you are free indeed. And I can c- kind of compare it to the counterfeit freedom, meaning where you say, I'm going to do anything I want, whenever I want, however I want. And that seems like ultimate freedom. Except when you experience that, it leads to some form of slavery or bondage. You either ruin a marriage, you ruin a relationship, you ruin your health. There's something that doesn't work. That's a counterfeit freedom. And then Jesus says, no, I've got a fuller freedom. It will give you the freedom to forgive. When you think you can't forgive that lousy, you know what? You can forgive. That doesn't have to be a weight around your shoulders forever. I'll give you the freedom from guilt. You can understand that what you did, and you can understand that God was aware of it, and he still loves you, and you can offer that right back to him. Freedom from pride. You can think of others first. It's okay. You can say you're sorry even. You can eat a lot more crow when you're free. Healthy crow. Good crow. You can freedom to serve, freedom to be generous, freedom to trust. I could go on. I told you last week, I, left, I, I listed 16, and I wrote down about another 30 more during the week. Just in my mind, just for me, not for you, just for me. God's not taking freedom from you. He's giving you freedom. In a dangerous world, he's saying, I want you to have maximum freedom, but it's only found in me. You shall be free. You shall be free indeed. Jesus says that's the freedom that you have. Well, today we're going to talk about a couple more of these he wants you to be full of it things. Things that to remind you that you're not crazy for being a Christian, no matter what age and stage of life you're in. Whether you're 15 and watching this right now or 18, whether you're dating, whether you're married, whether you're single for life, whether you're old, whether you know that you're in your last year of your life. These are things that he offers fully to you at every age and stage of life that you can miss, you can miss, you can miss, or you can take for granted. And I don't want that for anybody watching right now, anybody here. I want so badly for those of you who do not know Jesus to experience this fullness that so many followers of Jesus for 2,000 years have written about and lived for and prayed for so many to know. There's a letter I'm going to read here real quick, just a short little verse of it, and it was written to Jewish Christians uh, in Asia Minor that had been scattered about by persecution. These were believers in Christ that were formerly Jews that were called Jewish Christians, and they went to the southern rim of Asia, and they were scattered about because people were after the Christians and people were after the Jews at that time period. And so Peter writes them this letter. So imagine a group of people that he's writing to, 
that are kind of running, kind of moving away from the danger spot of major persecution. And here's what he writes. Kind of, I, I think, as a, as a reminder, here's what he says. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9. Though you have not seen him, talking about Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with, and read it with me, inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He says, though you don't see him right now, and though you're in problems right now, there is something that God is giving you that is bigger than fun, and it's called joy, because it's bigger than circumstances. Your circumstance right now, if I could paraphrase from Peter, your circumstance right now sucks. You're being hunted, you're away from your house, maybe your family's been busted up, maybe somebody's been imprisoned or worse, killed. He said, but guess what? Though you don't see Jesus now, you love him. Even though you're not with him right now in face, you believe in him. And because you believe with him, there's this thing that in spite of the circumstances that I'm reminding you of, it's inexpressible and it's glorious and it's joy. And you have it. And I'm reminding you, that is the gift of God. Paul said this to the church at Rome. And by the way, again, I could give you 50 passages on joy or more. Paul says this to Rome. This is his prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy. Why? And peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God gives you this thing called joy. There is deep joy in following and believing in Jesus that if you're outside of Christ right now, you've never really experienced. I'm sorry. And I'm going to tell you what you experience in place of joy. I'm going to tell you what you pursue in place of joy. And can I just say this? Jesus makes a correlation, and I'm not reading the passage. It's found in the Gospels. Where he says there's a joy that you can have. And the only similar thing in the world that non-Christians can understand it to, because Jesus compares it to, is the joy of a mother when she sees her baby at birth. The first time you see your baby. Jesus says that joy... That pain that you had in birth, all those worries, goes away in the minute that baby's laid in your arms and there's an inexpressible joy. And all the women who have had children said, amen. Is that right? That all of a sudden you can't explain it, but that baby means amazing. That's the thing that Jesus, so if you're non-Christian right now, a woman that's had a baby, you can understand that. If you're others, I don't, I don't believe you can. I, I really don't. It's etern, It's internal. It's deep, this joy. It's glorious. It's amazing. It's that good. Those without Jesus, and us at times, we can fall back into this. This is why I'm reminding you of these things. Generally speaking, the way that you want to experience fun is externally. Joy is internal. Something for Christians. The way that people want to have fun, doesn't people in life want to have fun? Don't you want to have fun? You do. Fun is dependent on your circumstances. So if you want to have fun, most people outside of Christ that I've seen specifically will pursue outside activities. They'll get their thrills and they'll get their chills doing something or going somewhere. In fact, people will go great lengths to experience a buzz. Amazing how much we'll spend, pay, or risk for a fun fix. From stuff, buying stuff, to places, to liquid and chemical ingestion. It's temporary and ex ex externally produced fun fix. In other words, we all want to have fun, and yet the Christian can, God offers this thing called joy. And there's nothing wrong with fun, except some people, since they can't feel joy, which I'm going to make an argument for, is greater they end up, they're into a fun, fixed lifestyle. When you look at some of your friends that got hooked on drugs or alcohol, that's what they were pursuing. It might have been masking some pain, but they thought it was fun or they wouldn't have done it. When some people spend themselves you know, into bankruptcy or into financial debt, it was fun for them to do that. They wanted the next fun fix. 
Some, you've heard the phrase, I live for the what? The weekend. I mean, I'm just living for the next fun fix. Can you imagine if you only lived a life for two out of every seven days? Think about that. If you're 70 years old, you've really only cared about living life for 20 years. The other 50, you just endured. That's the fun fix. That's the fun fix. That's the merry-go-round of the fun fix. You say, I live for the weekend. That's not what Jesus says. I give you a fuller life. I can tell you, I'm going to try and explain this thing called joy to you that's better than fun. Fun is fun, but there's something that's much better than that, much deeper than that. And the problem with fun it's subject to the law of diminishing returns. Next time you do it, you won't get the same fun fix. It is right. When you're dating somebody, I can remember dating Kathy. Everything we did was new. Every place we went was new. Every restaurant we, we went was new. Now, I don't know what it was like before Kathy. That's BK time for me, before Kathy. I don't know what that was like. But there are things right now that they're just not as fun anymore. We've done everything in Under the Sun to do together. And it's just not as fun. But yet, I would say that my life is more joy-filled, and I wouldn't trade any of that for when everything was new and fun. It was exciting, but I knew that it was diminishing returns. First time you go to Disney is great. Second time might be pretty good. You go there 10 times, and it's diminished. You buy a new car. It is phenomenal. You think this is the greatest car in the world. Two years later, you're ready to trade it in because it smells like a diaper. I mean, you get the concept. It's a law of diminishing returns. So the next time you'll pay more, you'll try harder, and here's the worst thing, you'll risk more. Why so many busted marriages at times? Because they're pursuing fun because it's diminished. And they make the mistake of believing that since that's diminished, the persons, the people I'm with, they've diminished. Thank God for his inexpressible joy. Thank God for his inexpressible joy. Joy in relationships. Looking across the room, I think there's so many of you that have given me joy. Joy in family. I mean, when you're a Christian, you get it. You treasure those times with the families together because there's just a joy. Even if they're still arguing, even if, if Jimmy and Roger are still arguing, there's still just a joy knowing they existed in your world. There's joy in simplicity. Remember my dad used to tell me, who is much more mature as a Christian as I get older than I ever thought he was. It's funny how your parents get wiser the older you get. He used to tell me, I said, Dad, what do you need to have fun? He said, a porch and a rocking chair. I said, that seems boring. He says, that's because you don't know. It's all. Just a sunset, hear the trees, listen to the birds, and there's something deep down inside of me. It's just inexpressible, but wow. The joy of natural beauty. Slow your time down right now and look at those trees. They're going from green to orange to yellow to red. Slow down and thank God. And you know what he'll give you as you do that? Joy. Your job becomes more than just a money-making machine when you have joy. You become thankful for it. You understand that work is good. You see there's opportunity there to lead people to Christ or to, or to at least love them like Christ. You feel a joy about that. You find a joy in a church. See, there's so many of you that want to gather together again. There's so many of you that have enjoyed online for the first time because you realize there's a joy that is just so deep that it's, it's amazing when we gather together. It's just, and it's God saying, I give you the joy, the joy in my body together. I'm going to show you four pictures that uh, when I've watched them and looked at them here recently, they bring me joy. The last one's going to be kind of weird, so I'm going to have to push it on you. But here's the first picture I want to show you. This brings me joy. See, that's our kids in Oak Ridge Kids. That's why we got to get the church open. 
not you of my age that are watching this right now, but these kids right now that you see, for seven months, very few of them have never heard the name of Jesus or heard about Moses or Noah or David. They've never had somebody just accept them and praise them and love them just because of who they are in the way that you can as a mentor or as a teacher. We've got to get open. We've got to get these kids back together. We've got to figure it out. We've got to pray to God to help us with this. So I see that kind of a picture, and I'm just like, God, what a gift. Amazing. I'll show you the second picture we have here. Frankie Charles sent me these pictures of the kids in Haiti last week. You know what I experienced right when I first saw them? Inexpressible joy. That we, we, meaning we, we're feeding 100 plus kids a day and their families. That honestly, if they didn't have that food, it's crazy to say they would starve. Or they would be ravaged by disease because of lack of nutrition. We're helping them with the school. I just feel joy, joy that God allows us to be part of that in an area that many of you will maybe never see again or ever see the first time. Or maybe some of you will going down the road. I just felt joy. Here's the third one. That's a prayer night up here on this stage right here when the seniors, which we didn't get to do this this year, seniors come up and we pray for all the students that graduate from high school. When I see that, I experience joy. Oak Bridge people have been getting married at our church. I call them power couples because they're just, God's assembling so many power couples for Jesus. And as he does that, I've seen a tradition that's kind of started amongst these Oak Bridge weddings, and I'm talking about now into the dozens. And they get up together, and they'll all gather around the bride and the groom, and they'll pray. And when I watch that, do you know what I experience? Joy inexpressible. Strength and comfort and peace and hope. All those things that God says, I give you in that moment. That outsiders, they just see, what are these guys doing? I mean, that's outside of the faith. They go, what, is, what are they doing? And I just get that. And here's the fourth one when I express, when I feel joy. See, I've gone to so many weddings. I mean, funerals. And when I'm doing a funeral, and I know the person is a believer in Christ, and I can see the person on the front row on each side of me crying, as I'm talking about heaven or their life. And I can feel through tears, through sorrow, through pain, from my own mom and dad's funeral, I can feel the joy that this is not the end. Death didn't have the final say. Victory has already been won in Christ, and it was claimed the day we accepted him, and it was revealed the day we stood before him. That is joy inexpressible in the midst of the deepest pain. I cannot think of a bigger loss than losing your 11-month-old child who you fought for for 10 months that's been sick, as a friend recently has. But I can also not express the joy that they have that someday they have the hope, the true solid rock hope, that they will see that baby again and all will be made as it should be in the love and the truth and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. That is a joy. That is a powerful joy. And that is a gift from God for every person that claims Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. That's right. Well, I return to pleasure seekers. And I see them partying at times, carousing, spending, snorting, living out wild fantasies with hoarse voices, clouded minds, bloodshot eyes, Asking each other, are we having fun yet? And I think the deceiver's done a pretty good job. And we got to keep, you're not crazy. You got to keep telling them about Jesus. You're not crazy. You're not crazy. Then I come into a service like this morning, and there's a few of them in this room here. But I could imagine my mind's eye when the room's full, and, and we sing our God through the wilderness and our joy in the heaviness. Our way when it seems there is no way, Jesus. This we know. We will see the victory come. We will hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. And I see a group of people that are full of joy. 
that an outsider can't understand what it's like to praise God and experience the great gift of joy that he abundantly pours on us. It's no wonder he says it's inexpressible and amazing, isn't it? Just a reminder for you guys now as I close up quickly with the last point. If you're a Christian, you say, well, I haven't been accessing as much joy, Tom. And I've told you that joy is bigger than your circumstances. Bigger than your hurt, bigger than your past, bigger than your sin, bigger than your broken relations, bigger than a tough memory. It is. But you say, I want to I want to access that more. Jesus offers this. Then here's just a couple things. Number one, turn up the grateful volume in your life. Turn up the gratitude button. You seek every place you can find and you be grateful. You be grateful that you're able to suck air right now. You be grateful you live in a country at this time. You be grateful that we have two parties that are able to battle each other and keep a balance of power. You be grateful for the magnificent system that God's put in place to bring freedom still into our world and our country, the most free country on planet Earth that's ever existed, ever. You find gratitude in a sunset. You find gratitude in a cool breeze. If you come up here fairly regularly, you'll see me sitting in the car out by a tree on the parking lot with one window rolled down and my door open because my other window won't roll down. But I'm very thankful thankful for the window that rolls down and the door that opens. I'm not dwelling on the window that won't come down. I want joy. And I tell you what, out by that tree, praising God, thinking about God, thinking about the blessings of God is more fun to me than spending 10 grand at Disney, just so you know that. I'm not against that. I think I'll be doing that in a couple years with my whole grandkid. But I wish I could get every one of them underneath that tree. I'd pay 50000 for that. They could figure that one out. Up the gratitude meter. With the person you're with, who you may be sideways, up the gratitude meter. And the second thing is, is give it to him. Trust God. Give it to him. There are so many things that are bigger than you can have. And it could be in the realm of health. It could be the, in the realm of something that's happened in your past, give it to him. I give this to you. I don't, I'm not carrying this anymore. This is yours. And God says, bring it on. Bring it on. I want to give you the gift of joy as you release that to me. Give it to him. Gratitude, trust, surrender. Give it to him. Give it to him in prayer. Don't worry about losing your fun. God will give you something better, and that's joy. And that's much better. Well, the last thing is, is that he wants you to be full of, and that's this. I'm just going to say it this way. He wants you to be fulfilled. He wants you to feel fulfillment. He does want you to feel like, well, what's next? I've heard some Christians say, well, is this all there is? And I think, well, they need their joy bucket filled up a little bit. Then they need to look back on it and use some of the freedom they have to be kind to some other people, do some of those things. But here's the part. So you say, well, how, what's the fill, but what's that fulfillment thing look like as a mom, as a, as a dad, as a son, as a daughter, as a brother, as a sister? What does that look like? What would that be in my world? And I can, first of all, tell you, here's what fulfillment is not, but we think it is. Here's what, if you're not a Christian right now, here's what you're running towards. I know this. I've done it. I still do it at times, but I know this, and you may not see it. This is where you're running to find fulfillment, and this is where you won't find it. We can spend our life searching for it, for it, finding it, that it thing that will give me fulfillment, purpose, joy, happiness, all the things that you think you want, that it thing, and it starts early. I'm just going to go through a quick list, and you can fill in your list at any age because it's similar to this one. It's just a different it. When I was young, you know what the it thing was for me? A Schwinn blue with a silver seat banana bike with streamers come out of the handles. That was the it. I mean, if I had it, if I had that Schwinn bike, if I had it, hey, life would be great. That's it. That's what I thought in early age. Then I got a little bit older, and I thought the it was a mini bike. Remember the mini bikes, the round big tires? I never got, I got the Schwinn bike, and after I got the Schwinn bike, after a while, I realized it wasn't what? It wasn't it. I didn't get the mini bike. I have Henry, my grandson, who I, 
he's five, he's innocent, I love him, he's phenomenal, he's kind. He comes up to me the other day, just the other day, this is two days ago, and last time I was with him, and he said, Grandpa, he said, uh, will you get me whatever the modern day mini bike looks like? They look like little bikes right now. One of his friends had one was riding around the subdivision. He said, will you give me that for Christmas? See, for Henry, his it was that bike. Now, what I know is, if I drop, I looked at one of Sam's, and I think it was 259 bucks, all right? This is why I'm going to tell Henry, speak to Grandma about that one. But anyway, this, this bike, and I know that after a month, that it won't be it anymore. Am I right? But he thinks it's it, and you, I don't, well, then I got a little older, I thought sports was it. If I just won enough titles, had enough accolades, was all conference, all state, whatever the accolade could be, that would be it. Achieved a couple things. That wasn't it. And you did too. Sit on band first chair, get the lead in the, the drama, whatever there was. Then you thought about dating somebody. Well, if I could just have that be it. Well, for Kathy, it was. So you don't have to listen to anything more. But you get the point. You think that's it. And I, here's what I know. I know that when Kathy started dating me, we got married, that wasn't it. I wasn't enough. I wasn't it. For some of you, you think it's marriage is it, if I get married. It won't be it. It won't be enough. It may be good, but it won't be it. They thought, well, if I just have kids, that'd be it. They're good. They're fine, but they're not it. They're not it, that's for sure. They're not it. Well, if I just get the job, if I just became a VP. For me, if I thought if I just started my own company that I owned, I did. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. And it won't be it for you either. If that's the, way you're, if that's the track you're on. If you say, I want to be a nurse, my life would be good. No, it may be good, but they, that nurse thing won't be it. It won't be enough. It won't last. Big house, dream vacation. Those are all fine, but they won't be it. That's not it. It is found only in Jesus Christ. He's enough. I know if you're outside of Christ, you, you say, I don't believe it. I've already told you the freedom he gives. I've already told you the joy he gives. I told you in fulfillment, I had to define that. It's this, this it of knowing Jesus. It's a vital, growing, genuine, transparent kind of friendship, relationship with God that's only found by trusting and following Jesus through his word. That's it. And when you find that, when you find that it, then every age and stage of life you can find fulfillment. You can know why you're in the dormitory studying so hard right now. You can ask Jesus, help me with this. You can know why when that door opens and your husband or your wife walks out or never comes in, you can say, God, why am I alone in this moment? What is there that I can find? I can still hold on to you and trust you. What's next? I know that you've got a future for me. You can find fulfillment in that. You can find fulfillment in Jesus anywhere you're at and any place you're at if you just learn to trust him and turn to him and say, God, I want to walk with you. Help me through this. Help me over this. Help me win this. Being open to him. Learning about him through his word. You know how many people have come to me and they've read the Bible, been in the Bible, and they go, it was so rich, so fulfilling. That's why we push small groups. That's why we teach the Bible here. It's so fulfilling to know more about our Savior and his love for us and his plan for us and his hope for us. It's fulfilling to learn and trust and follow his rhythm for your life, now listen to this, his prompting in your soul and the pleasure you get from him. Your rhythm, how God prompts you and the pleasure you get from God is going to be different than mine. I get jacked up when we're leading something, when we're opening something, when we're moving somewhere. You may, get, you may feel the pleasure of God when you're serving somebody. Going to a hospital. You may feel the pleasure of God when you're singing to God. But when you understand how you, you've been made by God, wired by God to experience the pleasure of God. And it may change through life. But when you do that, there is, you find fulfillment there that the world can't understand. You might, find it, you might find it in finding your giftedness in serving. You may find fulfillment in God by keeping one eye on this earth and one eye on heaven. I've said that a number of times. That's how I find it. God, I know that this happened here and I'm keeping an eye on you. Bring them together. Let me understand more and there's fulfillment. It's not in a thing, a place, or a person. 
you might find fulfillment knowing that he's with you. No matter what you've done. No matter how good, you, how bad, he's with you. It's all about Jesus. When you find that and you keep that front and center, he's more than enough. He's enough. That's what I want. So I'm going to have a challenge here. There should be a, a tab hopefully somewhere on the screen that pops up for the use that, that are watching online. It's a challenge to accept, to take in, to trust in this God who offers you his son Jesus. There's a tab that says, I want what God offers us through Jesus. I believe in him. There's no magic in that tab, but there is magic in trusting in Jesus. It's glorious. You're not crazy. And it may cost you something, but it'll give you so much more. It is that good, that glorious. I know you want that for your children and your children's children and your friends and your family. I know that, and I know God wants that for us. So some of you, maybe in this room, maybe you've got to make a decision. Maybe it's a, a recommitment to the decision. God, I want your joy. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to surrender to you. In these time periods right now, what's amazing is it is a crazy time period, isn't it? There, I don't know anybody that say, oh, no, let's keep COVID-19 around. Let's have some more disunity in the country. Let's argue all the place we go. Let's, I don't know anybody that's saying that. But here's what I'm telling you. Here's what I know. I've still experienced an expressible joy during this time period. Because God is so much bigger than these circumstances. And Christ followers, the millions of Christ followers on the planet Earth can too. Let's, let's, let's just take that offer from God. Touch that tab. Touch that little button if that's you. And say, I believe in Christ. That's the first time. Then, then go to informationoakbridgecc.com and let us know. Or let some friend that you know about Christ. What's going on? We're going to sing a song called Avail Available. And I'm going to pray and they're going to come out and sing it. And I just want to remind you, God is available for you. In the darkest of nights, when there seems to be no air in the room, he's available. He's available. God, we come to you and we just thank you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this place. We thank you that there's a generation of young people who you're rallying together at this time to spearhead their generation to trust in you, Jesus. Not to take away, but to give, to give to them. God, I pray that their love for you is fervent and strong. I pray for all people that are those middle years who are influencing their children because they're still underneath their roof or influencing friends because they still have a lot of community. They're in the dormitory or in the college. I pray that you give them a wisdom and a strength to be able to tell their friends, family, the people they have influence with that Jesus is a giver, not a taker. And what he gives you is sometimes inexpressibly good. God, and I pray for those that are in the third and fourth quarters of our life, that we run the race, we finish it well. We end with joy. We end with gratitude, not bitterness. Dear God, I thank you for the opportunities that you give us all. And I pray for our church, Oak Bridge, that both locations be a bright light for your son, that we be more bold than ever about understanding that people that are struggling through the problems of life need Jesus more than ever, Christian and non-Christian alike. Dear God, I pray for the hope that goes before us, and I thank you, dear God, that you are available. May we have the courage, dear Father, to make decisions for you this morning, today, anytime. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing.
Here's my last word of encouragement. Through time, through knowing Jesus more, which normally takes time, you experience freedom more. You experience joy more. You experience fulfillment more. Next week, I'll tell you the final thing we're going to talk about in this series. But I'll tell you what's going to be next week, not now. Let's get to living. If you're a Christian, let's get to living. God says, I offered you in the fullness. This is a busted world. I've overcome it. Even in spite of some things that go in your life. Hold on to me. Hang on to me. I offer those things. I'm greater than those circumstances. Let's get to living. Amen? Two words on your mind this week. Two words if you're a Christ follower on your mind all week. Before I say those two words, if you haven't accepted Christ yet, he knocks on the door of your heart every day. That invitation never stops. Here's the two words. Two words, and we're going to end it in prayer. Two words. Thank you. Every situation, thank you to God. Every situation, you find something to say thank you for. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. See you guys next week.